In this video we're going to continue our discussion of Newton's laws of motion and in particular we're going to look at the case of uniform circular motion. The first thing that we have to understand is what do we mean by uniform circular motion? What's uniform? Well what we mean by uniform circular motion is a motion where the speed of the object is not changing and it's going in a circle. So in other words, the magnitude of the velocity, which is, of course is just the speed, is constant. Only the direction of the object is changing. To think of a simple example, imagine tying a rock to the end of a, of a string and then swinging the string in a horizontal circle above your head. Well, here's what it would look like. So here's a top view. And if this object is going clockwise, then when the object is at this point in the circle, its velocity would be this in this direction. Let me call that V1. At some later time, the object has moved along the circle and the velocity is now in this direction, which we'll call V2. So what we're saying here is the magnitude of V1 and V2 is the same. That doesn't change as the object goes around the circle. However, you'll notice the direction is clearly changing. Now, if we're trying to figure out what the acceleration is for this motion, uh, if we're not careful, we'll get the wrong answer. If you remember that acceleration is defined as delta V over delta T, and this would be the average acceleration, you might be inclined to say the, the acceleration is zero because V2 and V1 have the same magnitude. However, that would be incorrect because we have to remember that acceleration and velocity are vectors. So I really need to make sure I put in explicitly those vector signs. So when we think about what is delta V, well in this case, if we go, as we go from 1 to 2, it would be V2 minus V1 over delta T. Clearly V2 minus V1 is not zero because those vectors are not in opposite directions. So A is not zero. What we'd like to do is we'd like to figure out what is the magnitude and the direction of the instantaneous acceleration for an object going in a circle. Well, let's, uh, let's start this out by looking at it conceptually. Let's look at what is the direction of the acceleration as our object goes from an initial velocity v1 to a velocity v2. I've purposely drawn these two points on the circle close together because ultimately what we want to look at is the limit as delta t goes to zero so we can get the instantaneous acceleration. To figure out what the direction of the acceleration is, what I want to do is just do the vector subtraction. Again, we know that the average acceleration is delta V over delta T, and so I need to figure out what delta V is. As we've previously covered, we know how to subtract vectors. Take V2 and add the negative of V1. So here's V1, here's V2, and you'll notice this vector here would be v2 minus v1. What do you notice about the direction? Well that's the direction of the average acceleration between these two points and notice that it's directed towards the center of the circle. It turns out as we take the limit as delta t goes to zero, so in other words again the instantaneous acceleration is the limit as delta t goes to zero of delta v over delta t, what we find then is that that direction is always perpendicular to the velocity or towards the center of the circle. So the instantaneous acceleration when the velocity is v1 is directly towards the center of the circle as it is when the object is at position number two. Notice then that A and V, the instantaneous acceleration and the instantaneous velocity are perpendicular to each other in uniform circular motion. 
So we know what the direction is. Now the question is, is what is the magnitude of the instantaneous acceleration? It turns out that the formula is that the instantaneous acceleration is v squared over r. I'm going to actually have you derive that yourself as part of an activity. So now we know that the acceleration is always towards the center of the circle and that the magnitude of the acceleration can be calculated by squaring the velocity and dividing by r, the radius. Let's define some other terms that are important when we're dealing with uniform circular motion. The first term is the period of the motion. We use the capital letter T to represent the period. And by the way, you may remember earlier in the course, I did not use T for tension. We used F subscript T because of this fact that when we're dealing with uniform circular motion, we want to use capital T to mean period. The period is simply the time for the object to go around once, so the time for one revolution. Frequency, on the other hand, is the inverse of the period. In other words, instead of time per revolution, frequency is the number of revolutions per time. So you can see they're inversely related. And the unit for frequency is revolutions per second, and that's the definition of a hertz. So 1 hertz is a revolution per second. We'll see later on in the course that it can also represent anything per second, so cycles per second, etc. Now, if we want to find the magnitude of the velocity, in other words, the speed, based on the period or the frequency, all we really have to think about is that our object goes through a distance of one circumference, or 2 pi r, in an amount of time of one period. Or, of course, we could write that as 2 pi r times f. So if we know the period or the frequency and the radius of the motion, we can figure out what the magnitude of the velocity is. And again, this is the magnitude because we know the direction is always changing, but the magnitude is the same for uniform circular motion. Why don't you go ahead and pause the video and just do this quick problem to make sure that you're understanding these formulas. All right, we have a rock on a string. It swung around with a period of 0.5 seconds. We're given the radius of the circle, and we're asked to find the magnitude and the direction of the acceleration for the rock. First, let me draw a picture. Again, this is going to be a top view. And let's say that at the moment that I'm drawing it, the rock is here. And let's say that it's going around our circle in a clockwise way. If that's true, then the instantaneous velocity at that point would be in that direction. In other words, the instantaneous velocity in uniform circular motion is always tangent to the circle. The acceleration is always directed towards the center of the circle. So that would be the direction of the acceleration, towards the center. Um, there are a couple other ways we refer to that direction. Sometimes you'll see it written as radially inward, simply meaning it's along the radius of the circle and in towards the center. Now, in terms of the, uh, the math in this problem, we know that v is 2 pi r divided by the period. In this case, the radius was 1, and the period was 0.5 seconds. And we therefore get 12.6 meters per second for the velocity. If we now take a look at the acceleration, a is v squared over r, and we get our 12.6 squared divided by 1, or 158 meters per second squared. So that would be the magnitude of the acceleration. Let's talk about the dynamics of uniform circular motion. By that, I mean what 
net force is required to make something accelerate in a circle with a constant speed. And of course, we've got Newton's second law to help us, help us with that. We know that the acceleration is equal to the net force divided by the mass. Let's talk about the term centripetal acceleration. Those of you who have had a physics course before, I'm sure have heard this term. Um, centripetal is simply a word that means towards the center. Therefore, when an object is in uniform circular motion, we can call the acceleration the centripetal acceleration just because we know that the acceleration is always towards the center of the circle. It doesn't mean that there's anything else special about this acceleration. It's just an acceleration. But we use that word centripetal to remind us of the direction. Now, when we look at Newton's second law, one of the important things to remember is Newton's second law is a vector equation. The net force and the acceleration always have to be in the same direction. So whatever forces are acting on this object to make it go in a circle, they all have to add up so that the net force is directly towards the center of the circle. The other thing we know is that when an object is undergoing uniform circular motion, the acceleration is equal in, uh, to v squared over r in magnitude. So the magnitude of the net force then would have to be equal to mv squared over r. Now, there are a couple other terms that you may have heard of before, centripetal force and centrifugal force. Let's first talk about the concept of centripetal force. Centripetal force means that the net force is towards the center of the circle. But I don't like to use that term because there's nothing, it's not like there's a new force called centripetal force. It's just if an object is going in a circle, the net force is towards the center of the circle. Let's talk about centrifugal force. Well, centrifugal force actually doesn't exist. Here's the idea. If you are actually in an object that's going in a circle, it might feel to you like there's a force outward on you. But in fact, there really isn't. And let's look at an example to make this concrete. Here I've got a convertible. And uh, let's say we've got the driver and the passenger. Let's say that the passenger is not wearing their seatbelt. And just for fun, let's say that this car is missing its doors. Now the driver has their seatbelt on, so they keep going with the car. But if the seat is nice and smooth and there is no seatbelt and there's no door, what does this person want to do? Well, what they want to do is continue in a straight line because if the seat doesn't have enough friction to exert a force on them and you don't have your seatbelt on and there's no door to give that inward force, well then that object, that person, is just going to follow the law of inertia. An object wants to keep going in a straight line unless there is a non-zero net force to change that. So it feels like there's a force outward on you in that case. If you've ever taken a corner too fast or been in a car where the driver does, you've probably felt that. But that's really just your body wanting to go in a straight line. Now normally, between the friction of the seat, the seat belt, and the door, there is an inward force and we have that inward force that keeps us in the car and keeps us going in the circle. So if we want our passenger to stay in the car, then as this car goes around a turn, there has to be an inward force. In other words, all the forces present have to add up to give us a net force towards the center of the circle. Well, let's do an example problem. How fast can a car take a turn without sliding out? So let me draw a couple pictures here just to kind of show what we're talking about. Let's say here's the turn that our car is going around. And this is a top view. And so here is our car. 
and uh, let's say that it's going in this direction. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a picture of the car as if it's coming towards us. So in other words, looking at it as if your eyeball is down here and you're watching the car come, come towards you. Well, let's draw the free body diagram for the car. It would have the normal force acting up. We would have the weight acting down. And then from this perspective of the car coming towards you, the, uh, the force would have to be towards the center of the circle if this car is going to go in a circle. In other words, we need the net force on this car to be in that direction. So what force is it that makes this car able to go in a circle? Well, it's the force of static friction that the road exerts on the tires. If you've ever had the unnerving experience of driving and hitting a patch of ice, you know all of a sudden you can't turn and you just go off in a straight line. So as long as there's enough friction between the road and the tires, then we can get that inward force towards the center of the circle. We know that for static friction, the formula says the force of static friction is less than or equal to the coefficient of static friction times the normal force. Now here we want to look at the fastest that the car can possibly go before sliding out. Well obviously that's going to be when the force of static friction is its maximum value. We also know in this problem, since the car is on a flat surface, we know that the normal force is just equal to mg, as we've done many times at this point. And therefore, the force of static friction would be the coefficient of static friction times mg. Now we're ready to solve the problem. We're going to think of the direction towards the center of the circle as the x direction. Therefore, the net force in the x direction is equal to mAx. But this car is going in uniform circular motion. And the only force acting in the x direction is the force of static friction. So the left-hand side becomes Fs. The right-hand side becomes mV squared over R. Because again, I'm replacing A with V squared over R. The force of static friction we said is mu s mg. So mu s mg is equal to mv squared over r. Notice that the masses cancel out. And what I find is that v is equal to the square root of mu s g times r. Now let's think about this for a minute. You'll notice that the larger the radius of the circle, the faster we can go. That makes sense. The tighter the corner you try to take, the, the slower you have to go in order not to slide out. Also notice the better the coefficient of friction, the faster we can go, as well as the acceleration due to gravity. If we were on a different planet with a higher value of g, we would get more friction because the surfaces would be pushed together more. If you plug in the values, you should be able to find that v is 10.1 meters per second. By the way, there's a reason that I don't put a plus or minus here. And that's because in uniform circular motion, we know we're only getting the magnitude of the velocity. And so it's going to be positive 10.1. Let's take a look at another example. Here we have a ball on a string that's swinging around in a circle. So if you've ever, ever played tether ball, for example, that's the kind of thing we're talking about. The ball has a mass of 0.5 kilograms. It swings on a 0.75 meter long string at an angle of approximately 50 degrees. So let's talk about which angle is being specified here. The angle that we're talking about is the angle from the ceiling. So that's the 50 degrees. You'll notice if that's 50 degrees, then this is also 50 degrees. We're also given the length. L to be 0.75 meters. We're asked for two things. What's the tension in the string and what's the speed of the ball? Well, the first thing I'm going to do 
as always in a Newton's Law problem, is I'm going to draw the free body diagram. How many forces are acting on this object? Well, it turns out there are only two. There's the tension in the string. Remember, we use FT for that. And then there is the weight of the object, mg. Now, in this particular problem, um, we know that the acceleration is going to always be towards the center of the circle. That's always true in uniform circular motion. Therefore, we know that the acceleration is going to be that way. And therefore, we want to split up our forces into the usual xy components. We can see that ft can be broken into the component in the horizontal direction, which would be ft cosine theta, since this angle is theta. And a vertical component, ft sine theta. Now we just need to go ahead and write down Newton's second law in each direction to solve for the two things that we're being asked for. Let's start with a y direction. The net force in the y direction is equal to the mass times the acceleration in the y direction. Now we're assuming this object is just going around in a horizontal circle, so there is no acceleration in the y direction. The ball is not going up or down. Therefore, when we fill in the left-hand side, we have Ft sine theta. That's the only force that's up. And then we have Mg acting down. And that has to be equal to zero because there is no acceleration in that direction. Therefore, Ft sine theta equals Mg, or Ft equals Mg over sine theta. I'll leave it to you to plug in the numbers and make sure that you get what I got, which was 6.4 newtons for the tension. Now, to figure out the, uh, the speed of the ball, we know that the net force in the x direction is equal to mAx, but it's in the x direction that we have our acceleration. Again, we know that since the object is going in uniform circular motion, the acceleration is v squared over r. And so when I plug in here, notice the only force in the x direction is ft cosine theta. So that's what goes in for the left. And then on the right, I can replace ax with v squared over r. Therefore, v is equal to Ft cosine theta times R over M. Now, we have to be a little bit careful before we plug in our values here. What do I mean by R? Well, R is not the length of the string. R is the radius that the object is actually going through. So what is R in terms of L? Well, we've got to do a little bit of trig here, but notice if this is the angle and L is the hypotenuse, notice that the adjacent side is R. And so the sine, sorry, the cosine of theta is going to be r over l, or r is equal to l cosine theta. So let me copy this formula and this formula to the next slide. We had v is equal to the square root of ft cosine theta times r over m, and then we also had that r is equal to L cosine theta. So now I'm just going to put this all together. Our final algebraic expression for the speed of the ball would simply be Ft cosine theta uh, 
times L cosine theta. And of course you could rewrite that as cosine squared theta if you wanted to. Um, again I'll leave it to you to make sure that I got the right answer. My final answer when I plugged in the values was 2 meters per second. So a couple things to remember in this problem. Remember that the acceleration is always towards the center. Oftentimes students will think the acceleration is in that direction. But the acceleration is towards the center of the circle that the object is actually going in. Also, when we talk about r, as in v squared over r, again, it's the radius of the circle. It's not the length of the string. So those are a couple places that students often get messed up when they're doing this problem. Let's look at the following amusement park ride. Uh, this ride is called the Gravitron and it goes by many different names. But if you've been to an amusement park before, you might have been on one of these types of rides. Basically the way this ride works is it's basically a big cylinder. You walk in, you stand up against the, the wall, and then the cylinder begins to spin. And once it's going a certain speed, what happens is the floor drops away. And you'll notice here there is no floor um, where the students are up against the wall. And so at that point um, the floor goes away but the students don't slip down the wall. They stay on the wall and remain safe. And then they bring the floor back up and they stop the ride. So let's see if we can figure out how this works. So here's my student up against the wall and let's say the floor is dropped out. Let's draw the free body diagram for this person as that cylinder, as the ride is spinning around. The free body diagram here looks a little bit different than we're used to because what is the direction of the normal force that the wall exerts on the person? Well, it's in that direction. We don't see that very often, that the normal force is horizontal, but the wall is definitely pushing on on the people and of course we know there's got to be a net force towards the center of the circle there's got to be a net force in that direction and it turns out the only force that can act towards the center in this case is the force the wall exerts which is a normal force now of course we know that there's the force of gravity acting down on the person and you'll notice that if our amusement park ride is going to be safe we better have another force acting up. What force will that be? Well, that's going to be the force of static friction. In other words, the only thing that's going to hold those people up is the friction between their clothing and the wall. And one of the things you may have noticed if you've been in one of these rides, that wall is always covered with carpet or with rubber, something that's going to have a good amount of friction associated with it. So let's do an example problem and see how it works out. Again, here's our free body diagram. So it says, what's the minimum coefficient of static friction so that a person will not fall? Well, we know that the force of static friction is less than or equal to mu times the normal force. And in this case, again, we're going to pick just the equal sign because we're looking at the minimum coefficient and that means we need to be at the maximum amount of static friction. Let's start with the y direction. The net force in the y direction is equal to the mass times the acceleration in the y direction. Now if we've done a good job as the engineer is designing this ride, the acceleration in the y direction should be zero. The person is not sliding down the wall. The only two forces acting are the static friction up and the force of gravity down. So we know that the force of static friction has to be equal to mg. Well, in order to figure out the force of static friction, we've got to know the normal force. How do we figure that out? It turns out we need to look at the x direction to find that because the normal force 
is acting in the x direction. Now in the x direction, the only force we have is Fn. We know that our people are undergoing uniform circular motion as they go around. Therefore, we can replace the acceleration with v squared over r. And what I'm now going to do is take that expression for the normal force and I'm going to plug it in to the force of friction. In other words, the force of friction is the coefficient of static friction times the normal force. And therefore, the coefficient of static friction times mv squared over r is equal to mg. You'll notice the mass of the person cancels out. And we're now able to solve for the coefficient of static friction. So this would be the minimum coefficient of static friction required for our person to not slide down the wall. We get gr over v squared. And now we can go ahead and plug in the values. Notice, by the way, we weren't given the velocity. 1.1 revolutions per second. What were we given there? Well, hopefully you said the frequency. Remember, revolutions per second is frequency. Therefore, we might want to first go ahead and just calculate v. We know that v is equal to 2 pi rf. In other words, the circumference divided by the period or the circumference times the frequency. If you calculate that, you should get that the velocity is 13.8 meters per second. So now that I have that, I can go back and calculate the coefficient of static friction. And again, this would be the minimum coefficient. So 9.8 divided by 2 meters divided by 13.8 squared. When you calculate this, what you should find is that you get 0 0.10. Remember, there are no units on coefficients of friction. It turns out that that's a very low coefficient of friction, which is good. In other words, whatever clothing our people are wearing when they come into this ride, there's definitely going to be at least that amount of uh, friction between their clothing and the wall, especially if we make sure our wall is made of something like rubber or carpeting where it's going to have some, some good friction properties. And that's really the kind of calculation that you have to do as an engineer if you're designing an amusement park ride.